Well, let me welcome you. I am Alan Borsik. I'm an increasingly senior fellow around here. And uh, with a long time interest, I might add, in education issues, going back to my days at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and uh, for 14 years now here. And a couple times a year, we really like to do education-related programs as part of the Lubar Center. Um, and I, when I say we, I mean uh, both the Marquette Law School and the Marquette College of Education, our uh, co-sponsor for this event. Um, and what is more timely or important uh, on that score than the subject we're dealing with here, which is school choice, the whole history of school choice. I don't need to tell hardly anybody in this room that Milwaukee is itself uh, a central factor, a central location in the whole history of school choice. And joining us today here is Kara Fitzpatrick. She is the author of this new book, uh, which will be for sale uh, after the program, uh, the fine people from Boswell are here, uh, and Kara will be autographing books um, at that point. Kara is a longtime education reporter for quite a number of years in, uh, in Tampa, at the Tampa Bay Times, where, among other things, she won the Pulitzer Prize for a uh, project, uh, the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for Local Reporting, I believe was the category they ended up putting it in for a project that dealt with school segregation in Pinellas County, just outside of Tampa, and how the uh, school officials had manipulated the system to increase and resegregate schools in that uh, area. She subsequently had a couple fellowships, including the prestigious Spencer Fellowship at Columbia University, which is where you really started on this book, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and is now working for an outfit called Chalkbeat, which is an online education uh, uh, reporting operation, very high quality. It's also free, so <laughs> sign up. <laughs> and they have, be, they have bases in, I think, eight? It's eight bureaus, yeah. Eight, eight bureaus in the country. The nearest one here would be Chicago, um, but uh, uh, also a strong national focus, and uh, Kara is uh, a story editor for, for Chalkbeat. And we invited her to Milwaukee because it's Milwaukee. Um, <laughs> let's uh, begin with, uh, uh, let's begin with a, a, a question about where you view yourself in this issue. Uh, as I've been telling people, you know, you, there's three ways to say the Packers beat the Bears. <laughs> The, the Packers beat the Bears, hooray. The Packers beat the Bears, boo, because I'm a Bears fan. I'm not, but nonetheless, there are such people. Or the, the Packers beat the Bears, and that's a fact. Where are you on that spectrum? Is this a partisan book? You know, the football reference doesn't help me a whole, whole lot. Well, <laughs> but, this is still But I Packer think I, I get the gist. Yeah, okay, so, so substitute anything you want. My, my mom's a football fan. I'll ask her later. Um, but, no, I, I very intentionally you said grew up, You grew up in kind of eastern state of Washington, yes. so no, no new, nearby football teams. <laughs> no, the, the Seattle Seahawks are the nearest one. So, and my side of the state's not a super big fan of that side of the state, so, you know, we make our peace with it. Um, but no, I, I set out to write a nonpartisan book, if you can, on this subject, to write a history. Um, I felt like we already had a number of partisan books, one, you know, one way or another, someone who has an opinion. You know, if you want to read someone who's firmly anti-school choice, then Diane Ravitch has written several books. You know, that, that exists out there. And what I was really sort of interested in was trying to tell the story of something and sort of looking at the intellectual history of, of an idea. You know, what, where does the idea of school vouchers come from? Can we trace that back to a person or a time? You know, and so, so I tried to, to, to do a neutral, fair-minded, sort of journalistic job. And, um, and I spent five years on it, and I spent the entire time telling people over and over, seriously, no, you're not going to 
figure it out. You know, I would have people tell me, no, 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 we get it. You're not taking a position. But really, like, wink and no. So <laughs> everyone, everyone thinks they, they can figure it out one way or another. And no one quite has, so. But you do reach a pretty provocative conclusion, starting with the title of the book, The Death of Public School, and starting with the first sentence in the book, which is, public education in America is in jeopardy. Yeah. Um, it, you go on to say uh, 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 that uh, the war over school choice has been the fiercest in this country's education battles because it is the most important. It's a struggle over the definition of public education. So define public education. What is a public school in today's world, or what are the different views on what is a public school? Well, in today's world, it gets sort of tricky, but at, at before today's world, if we could go back a little bit, it was traditionally defined as being secular, you know, tuition-free, and in theory, at least, open to everyone. You can talk about magnet schools and special admissions schools, but that was the general idea that our country arrived at, you know, in the late 1800s and then had for 100 some years. Now, you know, one of the, the things behind the title, one of the things I was thinking about is if you now have places in the country where you can go to, you know, say a Catholic school or even a charter school for K to 12 and have it paid for by the state, is that public education? You know, does that sort of change the definition? So though it is a provocative title, it was sort of meant to be a little wonkier than, than just um, you know, enrollment figures and where, where people are going to school. The, the use of the word death, the death of public school, 90% roughly of kids in America go to public schools still. That if you're counting charters, right? It'd be a little less if you're not counting charters. Yeah, OK. Schools. In Wisconsin, even including charters, and vouchers, even uh, the, in uh, the city of Milwaukee, where it's more like 50-50 that are in the traditional public system and not. But even overall in Wisconsin, it's still, I believe, over 90%. There's 800 some thousand in in public schools. There's including pu charter schools that are chartered through school boards, and there is something like 65,000 in either voucher using vouchers or attending independent charter schools. So it's still over 90%. That doesn't sound like the death throes. No, I don't think we're in a, like a death spiral, which is how someone put it to me recently. I think it's sort of this war over ideas and, and definitions, which is a little wonkier and nerdier. But, but you know, what we're, what we're seeing right now, and, and the thing that I think is maybe concerning in the last few years is this big push by conservatives to attack public schools. And I think before, even within the last maybe five years, you could kind of look for a middle ground. Okay, so you have a voucher program, but it's fairly small and you still have public schools and you still have charter schools. And it was more about this idea of, do these other things help improve the system? You know, or is this something that can coexist? And in Milwaukee, it's coexisted for a long time. But what I think is different in the last few years and concerning is this, this sort of strategic attack on public education that we're seeing from a lot of uh, conservatives. And it's, it's not subtle. It's not like a hidden thing. Um, you know, a couple of people at the Heritage Foundation wrote a piece before I was done writing the book, so maybe a year and a half ago or so, and said to win on school choice, we should be leaning into these culture wars. You know, we should be attacking public schools. That's kind of a different, you know, that's a bit of a shift. I think that is alarming in some ways. Um, you know, and then this shift that we've seen too since the pandemic of this drive for <coughs> universal vouchers, you know, that also is a rather notable shift in this conversation about school choice. Let's go back uh, to the history first, and then we'll get to the current scene. Uh, three, three bases in the history, or three faces in the history interest me. Uh, Milton Friedman, the much less known Marquette figure of, of uh, Father Virgil Bloom, and then the, uh, the way uh, and, uh, vouchers were initially used in the South to fight uh, school desegregation. Uh, let's start with uh, Milton Friedman, because that's kind of, I was kind of taught Milton Friedman invented vouchers 
or the concept of vouchers. How, how important a figure was he? Well, so when I started researching the book as an education reporter, I, I had heard basically two sort of origin stories. And it's interesting that, that even with an origin story, there's one for each side <laughs> of the issue. And so I had, I had heard sort of this stylized uh, conservative version, which was that Milton Friedman uh, was the father of, of school vouchers, that he wrote an essay in the 1950s you know, proposing a voucher system, a universal voucher system. And then sort of nothing really happens. He keeps the idea alive. And then Milwaukee happens in 1990. And then you can proceed to now. That was one version. And then the other version I heard, which was typically from people against school choice, um, you know, on the more liberal side, who would say, well, it has its origins in segregation. You know, and so it's, it's already a bad idea because of its, it started in the South with segregation to get around Brown versus Board. And I was trying to kind of square these two things because those are very different origin stories. And, um, and so I kind of started researching that. And what I thought was actually so interesting is that b both of those things are true. So you had segregationists in the South who actually in the years before Brown versus Board could see Brown coming because there had been some court cases at the university level. And so there was this movement to try to at least put on the books laws that would allow you to privatize the school system if Brown happened. And part of that was school vouchers, but it wasn't the only thing. In fact, it was actually viewed as more of a, historians call it a moderate option, which I find really strange to say, but, um, but because the other options were, were shutting the schools down. You know, I mean, they were very extreme things. And vouchers were viewed as sort of a mechanism to allow families to use state dollars to pay to send their kid to an all-white private school. So that started happening in the South. And then at the same time, Milton Friedman, who was then an economist at the University of Chicago, wrote an essay basically proposing a voucher system in really economic terms. You hear it referred to as a manifesto sometimes. And if you actually read it, it's, it's pretty dry stuff. Um, I think manifesto makes you think you're really diving into something. And, and it's, it's pretty dry stuff. And so he wrote this essay. And, and, and then at the same time, the same time period, you have Virgil Bloom, who was a, a professor at Marquette and a priest, and he was really looking at school vouchers as a religious liberty issue. You know, he really thought that you were, basically that the country was discriminating against religious families because you would, as a family, pay taxes to support the public schools, and then you would also have to pay tuition, you know, to pay for an education that reflected your values. And he thought that was really an issue of religious liberty and discrimination. And I thought he was really fascinating because he was making those arguments decades before what we see now with you know, John Roberts and the Supreme Court. And so I just thought how interesting that these things actually overlap and that both sides could be sort of right. They're just picking the origin story that they sort of like best. By the way, your book is extremely well researched to the point that you went to the Marquette archives and read all these old uh, position papers and, and letters and such from uh, Father Virgil Bloom, which I'm pretty sure you didn't have to stand in line waiting for a position there. I mean, <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty obscure stuff. But you know, you, <laughs> you know they have I you, haven't done anything like that. <laughs> they have you fill out a form if anyone else is interested in your topic, another researcher that you can fill out, put your name and number, and they'll give you a call. And I filled that out, and no one has ever called me. <laughs> I just, I think I've talked to one other person who's spent some time in the Bloom archives. But for as far as archival research goes, his letters are really kind of delightful because he was such a cranky guy. I mean, he really, like, very intelligent, very passionate about his subject, but really didn't like disagreement. And some of his letters, I mean, really, for archival research, you know, you're alone in the thing for a long time, so some things are funnier than maybe <laughs> elsewhere. But, but some of his letters, you know, they would, they would read like, you know, I see that you went to Georgetown. I'm surprised they didn't teach you the Constitution. You know, it was just like, who is this guy? So I, I enjoyed him and, and the archive. So, you know, if you get a chance, go <laughs> read some of his letters. 
call me. No one ever called. <laughs> in Milwaukee terms, he was ahead of his time. And in mm -hmm. fact, he did not live to see the day when Milwaukee emerged. No. What led up to Milwaukee being such a center? And I should say that one of the, perhaps the key figure in your book uh, is Polly Williams, then a uh, member of the Wisconsin Assembly, uh, uh, a key figure in the book. Uh, how did Milwaukee emerge, and especially what's the role of Polly? Well, so if I can back up one second before that. Okay. Because I want to just point out that segregationists did actually pass school voucher programs, and then they were dismantled by the courts. And, and something that I think is important before understanding Milwaukee is that even as the courts were dismantling these programs and saying, these are racist, they're trying to get around Brown, it's pretty obvious what's happening here. Even at the same time, then there were some sort of progressive liberal voices in the 60s and 70s who started saying that school vouchers could be used as a tool of empowerment for low-income children. And Christopher Jenks was one who's a professor at Harvard. Um, you know, and there, there were a few others in that. Actually, Kenneth Clark, who was involved in, in Brown versus Board, and, um, you know, and, and believed in integration. But he was one also who, who put some ideas out there. And both Kenneth Clark and Christopher Jenks wrote about some ideas that now would be considered charter schools. And so just decades ahead of. So I want to put that out there because I think it's important to understand that fairly early on, there were some voices saying, you don't have to do this quite like Milton Friedman has done, and you don't have to do this quite like the segregationists have done. You could use this for low-income children. And so I think that's important to understand because then what you have in Milwaukee is you have you know, what, what Holly Williams called this unholy alliance where she was a, a black Democrat, black nationalist, felt very strongly about um, serving her community and helping black children. And she ends up partnering with Tommy Thompson, you know, who is the, well, you guys all know who Tommy Thompson is. <laughs> but but she, ended up, she ends up partnering with him and, and coming together to create what then was a small school voucher program in Milwaukee that was, you know, the enrollment was capped and it was for low-income children. And it primarily served low-income black children, which is what Polly intended. And she very much viewed it through this same similar lens of you know, empowerment and, and not through a sort of Milton Friedman universal lens. And I think, I think that's really important to understand that it has those roots. Why Milwaukee, though, and not uh, you know, Tampa or Oklahoma City or who knows where? You know, I kind of wonder what's going on in the Midwest because you also had Virgil here and it's such a strange sort of coincidence, especially because, you know, Virgil didn't play a role in creating Milwaukee's program. And, and he it was just as cranky about that too because it didn't initially include religious schools. So I thought that was funny as well, but um, like very on brand for him. But I think, you know, there were some things here that made it possible. I mean, one, you had Polly Williams and she was someone who was interested in education and had proposed and tried a number of things to sort of push the Milwaukee Public Schools to improve um, outcomes for black students. So you had this fairly dynamic person here. You had a fairly ambitious you know, Republican governor who had already proposed a couple of voucher ideas that just went nowhere. Um, and then Milwaukee itself you know, has its own history of segregation and its own history of, of integration policies that you know, a lot of black families thought were putting the burden on them to integrate the schools. And then you also had this history of having these independent secular private schools that people thought were doing a good job of educating low-income children, particularly black and Latino children. And so I think all of the pieces were there in a way that you know, perhaps they weren't in other places. I would add, the Bradley Foundation, yeah. which, which fueled the movement in terms of uh, money, just, you know, just made it possible to do a lot of advocacy. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a little bit about that in the book, but this idea of sort of you know, paying for polls, paying for 
research, paying for conferences, you know, just getting the idea out there. Describe Polly some more and, and what her role was uh, more broadly. Um, I mean, she was, I think, to put it mildly, a divisive figure. You know, I didn't ever get to meet her because she died before I started working on the book. But um, I've, I've talked to her cousin and I watched and read old speeches and TV interviews. And, and she was not a, like a shy, subtle person. And, um, and I think that, you know, she felt very strongly about her belief system and was, was really unapologetic about, about working for the black community. And, you know, she was someone who was willing, obviously, to partner with people who she disagreed with on other issues to advance her causes. I think she was a pretty shrewd legislator, you know, and, um, and it's, it's, her journey is a lot of the book, but it's, it's not sort of surprising that along the way she ruffled feathers and got into disputes with people. And it's, it's, she's, she's an interesting figure. Her journey included being a uh, leading figure in advocacy nationwide, being taken to conferences, uh, almost all of them uh, on the conservative side, certainly yeah. the pro-voucher side, but then becoming disaffected. Yeah, what yeah. What was behind that? I mean, she she was for a little while sort of a darling of the right, and she was she was flown out to speak and, and appear with with various Republicans, you know, because the idea of a black Democrat partnering on school vouchers was very powerful. It was a very powerful image. It was very powerful and, and attracted media attention, and so it brought a lot of attention to the issue, even when it was rather small. I think you know it's interesting that within maybe five years she started started having some concerns and and becoming a little disillusioned, and a large part of that was just that she thought conservatives were going to push the idea in a direction that she wasn't interested in. She thought they were going to push for more of a Milton Friedman style uh, voucher system where any child, regardless of income, could participate. And at the time. A lot of the conservatives that she was kind of pointing fingers at were saying, "No, no, no, we're not gonna. We're, that's not the intention here." And and she she felt that it was it was moving in a direction that she did not approve of. That tension between universal vouchers and uh, a program that's targeted to giving uh, equal opportunity or better opportunity to low income and especially minority uh, children. Uh, still plays out to this day. Um, who, who's winning on that score and how has that battle evolved? Uh, I should take note, and I might even call on him, that one of the leading advocates on the social equity side is sitting in the back of the room. Um, I, where he probably I was doesn't not want to calling draw. him out. I want that to be known. I wasn't calling him out. That's it. Oh, yeah, I'm calling him out. Just, <laughs> I wasn't doing it, so. And uh, Dr. Howard Fuller, who was a close friend and partner with Polly Williams in those days. For, for Dr. Fuller, this has always been about giving black kids, Latino kids, low-income kids more opportunity. The wider range of, I mean, this led to a big split in 2009 in Wisconsin. The, the wider range of vouchers, you know, universal uh, programs or uh, much higher income levels. Uh, for, there was advocacy for no income caps. Uh, this became a big tension. How, how's that issue evolved and where does it stand now? Yeah, so one of, the, one of the questions I had, and one of the things I thought was interesting too that I didn't fully understand when I started researching the book was how much disagreement there really was on the pro-school choice side. Because so much of the attention and the stories and the media are about the two you know, anti and for sides. But I thought it was so interesting that within the school choice movement, there was so much debate and dissent about you know, what kind of accountability should we have? Should we have any kind of accountability? You know, what would that look like? Just very granular questions about what this looks like and that some of the alliances broke down over questions about who this is really for. And, you know, and so one of the kind of guiding questions I had when I was researching it was, well, 
who is essentially one in that? You know, is it is it Polly or is it Milton Friedman? Because those are very different visions for school choice. And I thought that was that was really interesting. And and even within the last like few years, I think it's really gone towards Milton Friedman's side because what we're seeing now is this strong push towards universal with the education savings accounts, which are very similar to a voucher, but are even more flexible. Um, you can, in some states, you can actually even pay for homeschooling costs, not in every state, but I think we're up to nine now with North Carolina, and Indiana would be 10, except they're like 99% are eligible. But nine states now where every child in the state is eligible for an ESA, which vary in value, but regardless of need. And that's a Milton Friedman. I mean, it's even maybe a step further because you can use it to pay for, in some cases, homeschooling, as I said. You know, you could use it to pay for maybe therapies if your child needed maybe occupational therapy. You can use it to pay for tuition. You can use it to pay for online program. You know, it's just very, very flexible. And that's, that's new even within the last, not the concept, but the, the real push for it is new within the last few years. And the rhetoric is very much towards that. You know, the rhetoric even has shifted from being, you used to hear it's a civil rights issue a lot. You know, you'd hear that it's going to improve the public school system through competition. You would hear a lot of talk about disadvantaged children. And a lot of the conversation right now is about parental freedom and parental rights and this idea that if it's, you know, if it's good for these kids, then it's definitely good for everybody's kids. You know, it's the whole picture. And so, so it's interesting because I think uh, Milton Friedman also didn't live to see where this has gone. You know, he lived to see other things. But, um, but I think his vision is the one that has, has triumphed. So what has been learned about the virtues or flaws of parental choice in choosing where kids go to school. Um, I mean, in Milwaukee, in the earlier days of the program, especially coming out of 1998, when the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled that it was constitutional to include religious schools, and that was the real birth of the voucher movement as we know it now in Milwaukee um, and statewide. Um, it was really easy to start a school and there was very little regulation. And the notion was parents will choose uh, well, not all, not the same thing for every kid, but they will choose yeah. good things for their kids and this will drive quality. Frankly, we also had the birth of a lot of really not good schools at that time. And now, starting about 2006 or so, uh, Wisconsin has a lot more regulation of, of the private schools. They have to be accredited. The kids take private, uh, take, take the public tests and report the scores, which they didn't in the early days. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of financial controls. Um, a lot of these are responses to specific problems at schools. I mean, the legend of the guy who used school money to buy himself two Mercedes. Mm -hmm. It's a true story. <laughs> I don't think it's it's also Indicative. Not, it's not limited to here. That's happened in a lot well, of places. Well, actually, the bigger problem in Milwaukee, in my view, and maybe this is true nationwide, wasn't the people who were crooks. There were a few of them. I dealt with several of them. I once had a shouting match with the Mercedes guy in a coffee shop about, <laughs> whether, about it was, whether it was a good idea <laughs> to, to have, I'm surprised we weren't kicked out of the coffee shop, um, whether, whether it was a good idea to use school money to buy yourself two Mercedes. But that, that was, wasn't- That the, was still up for debate. He, they, they, yes, it was. Uh, what was uh, he, the Mercedes he and, for? Like well, he, he felt he was entitled to the, because he'd used his private, his own money to, to pay for things, and, and this was a way of reimbursing himself. Oh. And that, and, and this was true. Teachers as would he like argued. in on that, because yeah. they use a lot of their own money to pay for like I, I finally said to him, you know what, I'm things. not a lawyer, I'm, I'm a journalist, <laughs> and there's a thing called a smell test, and this is bad. Um, <laughs> But, oh, wow. but and, and, and he and his, uh, frankly, disbarred attorney buddy who was along for this session um, said, you know, there's nothing in the regulations that says we couldn't do that, which was absolutely true. Yeah, well. So we've changed the regulation. Anyway, what have we learned about parental choice? This is the joy of journalism. Yeah. This is, this is, this is why we enjoy these jobs. Where else does that happen to you? <laughs> 
What, what have we learned, <laughs> we, the big we, about the wisdom of giving parents a really wide range of choice? Um, well, I'm utterly distracted by the Mercedes uh, <laughs> anecdote. But, um, but, but, you know, I think, I mean, Milwaukee is interesting because you do see over the life of the program this attempt to add accountability and regulation slowly. And I think that's one of the ways actually that it has, has worked out in that sense. Because if you had put all that on the program at the beginning, I think it wouldn't have passed. You know, there was too much disagreement about that sort of thing. And it was so hard to pass in the first place. But over time, because there have been issues like that, or schools, you know, that, that closed mid-year, and then you find out, well, they were having financial problems, you know, or you have families who make choices and then realize that actually it was a really bad choice, you know, and it wasn't as promised. And, and so I think Milwaukee is a good example of accountability and regulation being added over time. But there are, there are plenty of programs where we don't have the same level of accountability that Milwaukee has. And, and definitely not in every place can you compare test scores you know, and look up a public school and a, a private school accepting vouchers and try to make a comparison. You know, you can't do that in, in most places, I would say. Um, but the broader question about kind of what have we learned could go in a few different directions, right? I mean, you can talk about research, which was one of the questions I had was, you know, at the beginning there was kind of an assumption that choice would allow, especially vouchers, would allow kids to go to something better, that the private schools would be better. You know, I think that was sort of baked in in a way. Um, and, and you have this idea at the beginning of, we don't actually know how these will work. It's, it's basically a big experiment, you know? And so one of the questions I had was, well, 30 plus years on, and for charters as well, what can we say about how kids do? You know, does it improve the public school system? Because that was one part of the argument for it. And are there better outcomes for kids? And on, on really on both fronts, on school vouchers and charter schools, which obviously is a little different, it hasn't been sort of this panacea. It has not been this you know, incredible driver of improvement either for kids or for the public system. Why not? Why wasn't it? But panacea was a term that was used Yes, if you really, Around really want to be nerdy, Chubb and Moe said panacea, and a yeah. lot of people wish they had not, because it comes back to haunt them. That didn't, that didn't really turn out to be the case. You know, it's done different things, but it hasn't been a, the large success story that I think some advocates hoped for or expected. Why not? I mean, I think it's probably just a lot more complicated, <laughs> Not an easy question. right? It's just a lot more complicated because you're talking about two different things, too. You know, you're talking a lot about what's good for an individual family. And certainly as a reporter, I've interviewed families who are very pleased with the choices they're making and they maybe got out of a bad situation. That was definitely true in some cases in, in Florida where I wrote about under-resourced segregated schools that really the system was just ignoring some pretty glaring problems that they had themselves created. And so when you talk to a family who was trying to flee one of those schools, in Florida they had more options. They could pick a charter school, they could go to a voucher school if they qualified. You know, and, and so sometimes you did meet an individual family where yes, this worked out better. You know, because maybe I don't necessarily care about them getting a Catholic education, but they're not getting punched in the middle of math, which was a real thing that I would talk to people with second graders, where there were there was you know violent outbursts in classrooms, and you know just the idea that you're moving your kid just for basic safety is pretty heartbreaking. I think that's a big factor around yeah. here. No, it's a big factor smaller, in a lot of places. Smaller classes. Uh, more intimate schools, generally more smaller support, schools. More support, maybe for for children. Um, who more need relationships. It. So you have Academic that. Academic success, not necessarily such right. a big deal to a lot Well, I mean, parents. you're not also going to learn to read if someone's hitting you and you're scared to be in school. So it's kind of a tricky thing. But, but so you have the family, the individual tension, and then you have sort of this systemic tension. Well, what is this doing for the system? And one thing that I think is just an interesting wrinkle in the research is that there actually have been some studies showing that the traditional public schools improve a bit in terms of test scores, so make of that what you will, 
um, based on competition. But, but some of the major voucher programs for the actual kids who use the voucher, test scores are about the same, or in some cases they go down, especially math for whatever reason seems to be one where the scores have gone down. And there, there was a period of time where some of the studies showed, yes, it goes down, but then it sort of rebounds, you know, because there's transition there. But now the, the most recent sort of major studies have not been as positive. There, just to make it more complicated, <laughs> there are some positive aspects in the research as far as maybe getting kids to graduate high school and, and sort of life outcomes, you know, that, that their attendance might be a little better, you know, or they might be more likely to get to college. College completion is a little bit trickier because you have to, you know, to study that, you have to start when the kids are rather little. And so then by nature of it, things have changed. But anyway, so it's not, it's not this clear picture. You can really debate back and forth about what kind of outcomes you care about and what this is doing and who it's doing it for. Um, charters, let's uh, focus a little more on them. They started about the same time as the vouchers in Milwaukee and our uh, neighbor here in the Midwest, Minnesota. Uh, what's the charter movement's uh, progress report at this point, if in, in broad strokes? The, so charter school started in Minnesota in, in 1991, and it's sort of it's one of the things I thought was interesting in this was the idea of charter schools and and vouchers kind of bumping up against each other as reform ideas. Because what you had was, you know, when Republicans were pushing for school vouchers as a mechanism of education reform, Democrats didn't necessarily have a, like a good answer to that other than opposition. So if you're talking about what do we have that improves something, I think charter schools ended up sort of fitting that what do we have category because Democrats in Minnesota were the ones sort of pushing it. And this idea was, well, we'll create a new type of public school, but it will be very firmly in the public education sphere. So it will be accountability and regulation, but it'll be free of sort of some of the bureaucracy of school districts. And so you'll have kind of a publicly funded autonomous school. And that might drive innovation and give people different options. You know, maybe they can have a longer school day or a longer school year. So that was the idea. And Republicans were largely for that as well, because it's still choice. It's maybe not like the choiciest of choice options, but it's still choice. And so you had this kind of bipartisan agreement around charter schools for a long time, which allowed them to spread. And so now, you know, I would, until recent years, I would say charter schools have actually been the more sort of impactful reform in terms of what it's done to the system. Because there's now, I think with Montana, there's now 46 states and Washington DC where you can have charter schools. And it's the same kind of thing. The regulation and the accountability varies a bit, you know, based on whether you're in Arizona or you're in Massachusetts. Um, what's interesting with charter schools as far as research goes is that for, for quite a while, you know, the research on charters said that, that they did about the same, again, as the traditional public schools as far as test scores go. Um, Credo, which is a group associated with Stanford who studied charters for a really long time, just in the last like four months, had a study come out and say that charter schools on average uh, have a little bit of a test score edge on traditional public schools, but it is tiny. Like we're talking about the difference between the 50th percentile and like 50.4. Like it's very, very small. But I wanna point out that it's on average because when you're talking about charter schools, the nature of them is that they're supposed to be different. So it's hard to talk about them in kind of a monolithic way. And what you see sometimes when you look at the research is that some areas have much better charter schools than others. You know, so like Boston is one example where the charter schools have generally been considered really good and high performing. And part of that, I think, is that Boston was really, really choosy about who they let open a school. And other places were like, anybody, open a school, let's see how it goes. And some of those didn't go super well. We had this thing the last uh, three plus years called the pandemic. <laughs> uh -huh. oh. I was writing this I, during that time. It was super fun. 
what impact has that had on the whole school choice movement and the debate over school choice? I mean, it's kind of lit the whole thing on fire. It's just been this massive historic wave of school choice legislation. Um, and I think, you know, part of that is that when the pandemic first started and school districts closed schools down and kids were home for remote learning and then they had some hybrid options, it, you know, it didn't go well and it was extremely hard on a lot of families. And, and so you had that element to it. You also had families who maybe saw things in remote learning that they didn't like. And it was like a, kind of a window into classrooms. And, and some parents saw things that they maybe weren't aware of and didn't like. You also just had the like kind of the basic fact that it's really hard if you have working parents and the children are suddenly at home with you and you're supposed to be doing the remote learning and your job at the same time. And so for some families, you know, it turned into this short term, I have to have my kid in school somewhere. And so maybe they moved to a charter school or maybe they tried out a private school or maybe they homeschooled. And some of those folks, it was a short term arrangement and they went back to what they'd been doing when things opened up more. And for some, it, it just changed things. You know, and part of that I think too is if you have kids, transitions are hard. So if you've already moved your kid to a Catholic school, to move them again, you know, is hard. And so there was that element of, of this feeling that parents were unhappy, were dissatisfied. And then I think, you know, Republicans really leaned into that politically. You know, they really saw that there was a political opportunity there especially in red states where you already had programs. You know, it's a lot easier to start a new one or expand the one you have if there's already some base of support and, and something there. Um, and we've just, we've had a, just a huge wave of, of legislation. Is there anything that can be said at this point, because it's early, about what the impact of universal vouchers is in the states that have passed it, Utah or wherever? It's pretty early. I mean, one of the things that's, that's been happening so far is that some of the cost projections, you know, the actual amount now that they're saying it's gonna cost is far higher than what people were talking about. When they were passing it, you know, that, that's happening in Arizona, in Florida a little bit. One sort of interesting thing is that a lot of the people that are, sort of taking up the state on this idea of an ESA are people who actually were already in private schools. Because if you make everyone eligible and your family was already paying for private education and now the state is going to pay for it, a lot of people are gonna take you up on that. And so in Florida, I think it was something like 69% of the, of the new people taking ESAs uh, were already in, in private education. Meantime, back at the public school ranch, um, what shape are public schools in? I mean, uh, uh, in, in the book, again, turning to uh, the opening passages, you say this is a dangerous moment for public schools in America. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people on the public school side in Wisconsin would agree with that. We can't afford two systems. Uh, the new state budget gave a lot more money a lot bigger increases to voucher and charter per capitas than to public schools. Um, there's a lot of worry about the state of public schools. And we have a new and very serious lawsuit um, challenging the whole financing, financial system of, of vouchers and charters. Anyway, what uh, amplify on that. What's the dangerous moment and where is it going? Yeah, you don't, you don't keep it quiet around here. Like the week I come, there's a lawsuit <laughs> challenging not just the voucher programs, but charter schools, the whole thing. It's like, wow, okay, going to Milwaukee. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, part of the, I think part of the danger right now for public schools is, you know, that you have some pretty, you know, pretty horrible effects from the pandemic. You know, the places... Everyone was hurt by the pandemic in terms of test scores and outcomes for kids, but the places that had their public schools closed longer got hurt a little worse in terms of, of right outcomes. Here. Um, you know, and schools are trying to deal with that. We had a pretty huge infusion of, 
you know, of COVID relief federal dollars. And now, you know, there's, they keep referring to this fiscal cliff, but those are gonna, you have to spend or commit them, I think by next fall. Um, and you have kids who've come back who, you know, it kind of broke something in a way with the idea that every day you must be in school. You know, and so we have huge rates of chronic absenteeism. Some of that's also a little bit just because um, people have been sick too, you know, people miss school. And now I think there's a greater awareness about maybe not sending your kid to school sick. So some families are keeping kids home, but, but their absenteeism rates are high. Behavior is, is pretty high. Um, you talk to teachers who are trying to catch up kids who are behind in sort of weird ways. You know, if you had a kid who was doing remote learning, you know, say in second grade, and so they missed some foundational steps of math, and now maybe they're in fourth or fifth grade, and, but they were in school last year. And so it's this weird thing of, of missing some key things along the way, and so teachers are having to sit there and, and sort of figure out, okay, I'm gonna teach, fifth grade math, but I'm also gonna spend time reviewing these pieces of second grade math that maybe they didn't master. Um, you know, and you have the kids that were fairly young with gaps in, in learning to read. It's really hard to learn to read on a screen. Um, you know, and so there's just, there's a ton of need and there's not going to be probably a ton of, of money. You know, and and, not to get super in the weeds, which I feel like I'm constantly doing, but, but with the COVID relief money, people spent that in a lot of different ways. But when you have one-time money, generally hiring a bunch of people isn't a great idea because then the money runs out, you get rid of the people. And so some places invested in like the buildings, you know, maybe our, our schools are 70 years old and they have problems, you know, and so maybe they didn't hire a bunch of reading specialists and counselors and, and so the combination of, I think, a system that has a lot of really intense needs with the political rhetoric, you know, where some people are talking pretty aggressively about kids getting indoctrinated in public schools and, and you know, some of the stuff that you're hearing in the Republican primary debates, I, I think that is pretty dangerous for the public system. You know, I think that combination is, is pretty rough. And when I've been places, I've had parents come up and tell me, like, oh, you know, I really wanted to send my kid to a public school, but I didn't think they were going to thrive in a class with 35 other kids. Or, you know, at the time, I couldn't even go in to tour the school, but I'm just supposed to enroll in, but I could tour this private school. You know, it's just, there's, um, I think, a lot of difficult issues right now with the public system. We're going to take questions. Let me repeat that term, questions, from uh, the audience in, in a moment. Um, <clears throat> but first, a summary question from me, which is, what's the summary? Uh, in what ways <laughs> has school choice in the broadest strokes been successful? In what ways has it not? In what ways is the jury still out? So I've gotten a lot of people who are really mad about the subtitle of the book um, because it's conservatives have won and it's past tense. I've heard that a lot from people, um, you know, mostly. Uh, How conservatives won the war over education in America. Yes, just well, I think conservatives are pretty happy to win, but they don't like the idea that it might kill off the public school system. So I get that complaint. And then um, uh, liberals really, really don't think conservatives have won yet. They might be winning, but they haven't won, and so I hear that. Um, but you know, one of the things that I think is, is really incredible, and you can view it as a good or a bad thing depending on where you are on the issue, but if you look at where we started as a country, when you, could, when you could safely say that we had something called a traditional public school and you could define what that was, you know, which is the start of the book, and to, to where we are now, you know, where I really do think there are some pretty blurry lines as far as what you can call public education when we're putting millions of dollars into something that is not a traditional public school and the fact that you can talk about 
having such radically different education systems, maybe in Florida versus Washington State, where I'm from, and, and the legal stuff, which we didn't get into, but there's a fair amount of legal history in the book, um, looking at these really pivotal court cases that, that conservatives have won. And with the court stuff, you know, the anti-school choice crowd have won plenty of victories too, but not the key ones, right? <laughs> so we have at this moment a Supreme Court that is, has pretty much said, we're okay with a lot of this. You know, we're okay with, with some of these different ways of providing public dollars for private education. And the way the court is made up now, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. We're actually, Oklahoma just approved the first religious charter school, which is such a crazy development that it's not even in the book. And, and so, I, you know, I just think that it's, it's a radical shift and what we have as this country's education system. And enrollment numbers may ebb and flow, but, but that idea that you have all these things, I, I think is pretty, pretty remarkable. Questions, I'd be glad to take questions from anybody. We certainly have an engaged and passionate audience here. Alan, give me one second. I see someone over here, and then if you could raise your hand, and I'll try and make my way back. This lady, uh, I, I, is the Doogee things working here? No. Oh, no. Then no, I they think don't. This lady was going to ask. Oh. Someone. Not to well, make you run. Yeah, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take uh, Will first here, and then we'll move down here. No, 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 sorry, no. sorry. I was trying for you there. But, but sorry, seriously, but will... we're looking for questions and not speeches. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity here, and thank you for the presentation. So you mentioned one area that there is sort of a preponderance of evidence that might be favorable was with regard to the effects on public schools. Uh, you know, currently there might be some improvement from competitive effects. So is there a way to characterize things rather than as a danger, maybe as an opportunity for public schools to see improvement uh, with the growing uh, voucher and ESA sectors? Did you want to take that? Or no, no. <laughs> you, you're, you're... I'm joking. I'm just joking. No. Um... Yeah, I I'm mean, just I, here to listen. <laughs> I, I was going to go with the hard questions, go to Alan. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think school choice people certainly would frame it that way, that, that if, if it does actually create some improvement in the public education sector, then, you know, what is there to fear here? You know, that this, this might actually be a good thing. And it's, I try so hard not to go deeply into the weeds, and yet here I am. Um, one of the things I think is sort of interesting is, it's hard to square these things of, so the existence of charters, because they include charters in that, and the existence of choice can drive some improvement in the public system. Again, as measured largely by, by test scores, but also you know, for charters um, in graduation rates. So at what point is it a harm? And, and so some of that is actually just the size of the systems. Because, so for instance, for charter schools, there's some research last year from Doug Harris in Tulane, who was, he was looking at, well, at what sort of percentage do, do charters in a system improve metrics for everybody? And, and it was something like around 10%. So if there's 10% of charters in the system, then everybody's graduation rates go up and everybody's test scores go up. And one of the ways that that happens is that the lowest performing traditional public schools actually close. So if you're against any school closing, then this is not good for you. But if you're against the worst performing, or if you're for the worst performing schools closing, then maybe this is a good thing. The point at which it kind of starts tipping is no one sets up the system that way because it's not a system. The charter schools exist autonomously. And so when it starts to get to greater and greater numbers of them, then I think that's where you start maybe seeing harm in terms of the traditional public system because they're obligated to serve everyone by law. But if you start losing a lot of kids to other things, then you're paying you know, to keep the lights on, but maybe now there's a lot fewer kids in the school, so there's some financial things. You know, and, and at a certain point, the question is also just at what point does this replace that? You know, and I think we see that play out a little bit in, um, you know, in some of the cities where especially charters are quite vibrant. You know, um, Philadelphia is a large sector of charters. 
San Antonio right now, the school district's talking about closing schools because charter schools are extremely popular there. Um, Washington, D.C. New Orleans, obviously, is the sort of major example because all of their public schools are now charters. And so I think it's, it's a more complicated question than it seems like on the on the service. And if I answer like this for every one of them, no one else will get to uh, ask a question. But, but does, that, does that answer your question? It's a good question. Thank you for pointing out that how complicated and nuanced um, some of this, um, these statistics are and the whole movement toward, from public school to voucher schools and charter schools. And I've always been confused uh, about what it all means. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about, about 30 years ago, or 25 or 30 years ago, there was a movement. Um, there seemed to be a, a preference among certain people for privatization of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, schools, garbage collection, mail. Um, Prisons. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And um, I'm one, you know, and that sort of private, that sort of government, uh, public versus private. And there was a belief, perhaps a false belief, that private was better and that anything government was not better. And in my own community, there was a point when this is a very a very small thing compared to education. We outsourced our recyclable collection. And recently, 30 years later, um, we've gone back to hiring uh, public employees because it's more expensive uh, for the community to pay for, for private. So is that kind of the same um, kind of movement that you see now where sometimes it's working well and sometimes it isn't? And is there a pendulum that, you know, that swung this way? Do you think it'll come back the other way, or where are you? That's an interesting question. Um, could everyone hear that okay? No, no, I'm just making sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, especially in, in the 80s, there was this push towards privatization. And it's sort of the Milton Friedman economics idea that government is less efficient and, and that, you know, private industry and businesses will naturally do it better. You know, you run into some issues with that when you're talking about something that is supposed to be sort of a public good, because sometimes the ways that business makes something more efficient is not, in fact, good for kids. You know, um, Arizona had a, an issue with charter schools where they were having kids go through in shifts, like shifts during the day, um, because you could get more money per student if you served more kids, and so the you know, morning kids and afternoon kids. And that's like a very business sort of oriented idea, but you know, I think you could probably say safely that that's not the best innovation in, in education. But I think when you're talking about systemic stuff, it's a little bit harder to say definitively good or bad, right? Because American education is very decentralized, and so every place kind of does it a little bit differently. I do wonder if we'll see a backlash just to some of the rhetoric, you know, some of the very intense um, conservative rhetoric around public education, and if that won't swing things the other way, because um, a colleague of mine wrote something interesting about polling that, that happens every year where they ask, the public, how they feel about public education, and they ask parents how they feel about their child's school. And there's this huge divide where the public right now, we're at like a historic low for how the public feels about public education. Because if you're listening to this stuff, but you're not connected to a public school, then it sounds pretty terrible. Uh, but parents, even during the pandemic, were largely happy with their child's school. And so you kind of have this disconnect. And I wonder that with the just with some of the over-the-top rhetoric, because just as a parent myself, when people are talking about social emotional learning being some kind of indoctrination strategy, I know at my kid's school it involves a mood meter where they ask the kids how they're feeling in the morning. And to me, you know, so there's a little bit, I think, of a disconnect where you see things in your public school and it's not what you're hearing on the news. So I wonder if there will be a backlash in that way. Let's do one more question. Okay, Hillary's right there. Can you speak to how uh, 
teachers' unions fit into the equation on the public schools these days? Well, I know that's a, probably a hot topic, but yeah, it, it it's interesting because teachers' unions have opposed basically every sort of every major reform they've opposed, at least at the beginning, charter schools. Uh, definitely private school choice have always been in opposition to that. But even things like dual enrollment where high school kids can go to, you know, to college in junior and senior years and get credit, teachers unions were opposed to that. Um, I think, so just generally speaking, they're in favor of the like one best system, we need to invest in the one best system. I think one of the things that we saw during the pandemic that frustrated a lot of parents is that you know, teachers, of course, are there for kids, but teachers are also adults. And the needs of kids during the pandemic and the needs of the adults working in the building didn't always line up necessarily. And, and so you saw teachers' unions go in really different ways with that. And, and some of it, I think, created a lot of backlash against the teachers' unions. Because when parents are saying the kids have to be in school, we've got to find some way to get the kids to school. And some of the teachers' unions, you know, like Chicago was a real um, hotbed for a while. In the teachers' unions are saying, but it endangers our people. You know, you just kind of had this conflict between what was good for grown-ups and what was good for kids. And so, and then uh, just sort of interestingly, <laughs> I, I think some of the rhetoric, again, is a little bonkers sometimes, but you know, you had Mike Pompeo at one point say, Randy Weingarten, who's the, a teacher's union leader nationally, that she was the most dangerous person in America. And it's like, I, I don't know. That's a little, I think that's a little over the top. But if that answers your question. What do you say, Hillary? Should we take another question? We're in overtime If here. we can do one quick question and one quick answer. I Each think team gets a runner on second base. To... <laughs> I'll be fast. Hard question, asked quickly. If vouchers were in part supported because of the potential to keep school segregated, and then they grew because maybe the reverse could be true, have we seen that when we have more open access to voucher systems, do those schools end up being very homogenous or not? Here in Milwaukee, we do have income-based voucher eligibility. I wonder... You know, it seems as though most schools that are voucher schools are all vouchered children rather than some mix of tuition and non. I wonder if that's true everywhere. I wonder if there's things like caps on the ratio of enrollment that could be subsidized, if that exists anywhere, and if there's any desegregative benefit that could be possible from that policy. Yeah, it's a good question um, because what I often hear from people who oppose school choice is that it will cause segregation. Um, so there's two things on that. The public schools themselves are quite segregated in, in most places, you know. Um, and so you already have a, a public school system that is struggling with segregation, both racial and socioeconomic. Um, and then actually, it might change with this push towards universal because we don't quite know yet what's gonna happen with some of these um, programs where everyone qualifies. But there's actually not much research to show that the existing, the smaller school voucher programs cause segregation. Um, there was one study in Louisiana where it was sort of null, but, but there was like even a little bit of a, a benefit because so often the private schools are white. And so if a lot of the voucher recipients are black or Latino, then that might create a little bit of integration in the private schools. Um, but if, this, if the system gets a lot bigger, I think that's a bit of an open question and something that I hope they research because we just don't know when you're talking about these really, really big systems. And it, it's just true in all school settings that there tends to be some level of segregation oftentimes. I think we will stop. <laughs> Do you want anything? in conclusion in two sentences? Oh no, I have no two sentence. I would already taken like a breath and be like, okay. Uh, <laughs> if, if, I, if I may say so, Marquette, 
Marquette Law School, the Lubar Center, and me personally, on all four levels, we stand four square in favor of level-headed, serious, thoughtful discussion of major issues. I think that's what we've had here today. Uh, did we reach a uh, powerful conclusion that will set the world on fire? No, but I didn't expect that. Uh, have we helped just have that discussion? Is it good that people from both sides are in the room here and, and uh, listening? And for that matter, is this a book that, to my knowledge, and I know a fair amount about the Milwaukee situation, the Milwaukee passages in here are really accurate and well-researched. All that said, a great thanks to Kara Fitzpatrick for being here, for doing this, and we will have more in the future. In the meantime, there will be books for sale outside here, and great, great thanks to all of you for being here and for being engaged in this whole subject. Thank you.